Well, I am going to preach on trust. As I had already indicated, I had a, a series I was going to start in mine and kind of, you know, unfolding. And, you know, a day or two ago, the Lord began, I can't get away from this. I started talking about trust a little bit a uh, week before last. Last week, I was out of the pulpit in Fort Worth for the conference. And by the way, Dennis was good back here, wasn't he? I mean, I, I know you enjoyed him. He's a good friend and a good preacher. Uh, but at any rate, two Sundays ago, I preached a message and talked a lot about trust in that message. It stirred some things in me that I'm going to continue with today, and uh, I don't frankly know if I'll finish it today or uh, it'll go to next Sunday as well. We'll just see. But I know this is what is being emphasized in me, because trust really is the primary determinant of your quality of life the kind of life you experience, your trust in God. Your trust, your unconditional trust in God is what removes anxiety about the uncertainties of the future. It's what uh, brings you through hard places where confusion might seem to reign and you really don't know what's going down. It is your trust in God that will be your anchor in a storm, that will be your rock to stand on. The rock of the Word, of course, but it will be your trust in that Word. God and His Word are one. Unconditional trust. And you ought to be able to see this because when you trust God unconditionally to do what He says He's going to do in His Word, I mean, look at all of the promises that are ours. By the stripes of Jesus you were healed, therefore you are healed. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. He wishes above all things that you prosper and be in health, including the prosperity of your soul. I mean, the list goes on and on. God tells you things in his word that if you take him at his word, if you trust him unconditionally, removes every care that you might encounter in your life. Let me say this to you. If you fear anything, you're not trusting God. If you get angry and resentful and bitter at other people, you're not trusting God. If you're jealous or covetous, if you, I mean, you just go down the list. You're not trusting the Lord. When you trust the Lord unconditionally, you can't help but feel peace. And I said the last time I preached that this really is the, uh, the genesis of real peace in your life, the peace of God that passes all understanding, garrisons about your heart and your mind. It is in trusting Him. And boy, that's what your quality of life is going to be determined by. Are you happy? Are you a happy camper? Are you excited about your life? Are you rejoicing in the Lord? I mean right now. Look at, uh, uh, let's see, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 for a moment. Put that on the screen if you would, please. First thing we see is rejoice evermore. 17 says, pray without ceasing. 18 says, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He didn't say it's the will of God in Christ for you to be healed or for you to be prosperous or for you to, uh, you know, be successful in your earthly endeavors to prosper and be in health. He doesn't say that. He summarizes his will by saying, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give God thanks. A lot of people are nodding their heads. He said, that's the will of God. That's a summary. Because if these things happen, you'll walk out the will of God. You will walk out the full will of God in your life. That's the way the scripture reads. This is what he says his will is. So, are you doing this? 
Are you living here? Now, that's a rhetorical question. I don't want to make anybody tell an untruth here. Uh, but basically, uh, I would suggest that it's really not. I don't see many Christians, of our persuasion anyway, giving thanks for the new administration we've got in office. Uh, uh, giving thanks for our new president, our new House of Representatives, our new Senate. But the Bible says you're to give thanks. Now, how can you really do that? By understanding what the Word has to say. This is trusting God. God and His Word are one. So what does the Word have to say about this? The Word tells us that it doesn't matter who is in an office of authority. If we as the body of Christ pray for them, then we can experience a quiet and peaceable life. And we see throughout the Word, He can use heathen, unregenerate leaders, uh, kings, whatever you want to call it, to promote the will of God and to do the will of God for the children of God. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So, you know, we should be able to give thanks for the government that we have. Now, you know, I did say, uh, Romans 13 says, we obey the law of the land. We do it with a good attitude. And of course, you know, uh, we may have opinions about how an administration got in office, uh, the level of corruption involved. All of these things don't really matter in terms of our approach to life right now. We do the best we can to live right before God, obey the laws to the extent the laws don't require us to disobey the law of God. That's the highest law. And most of our laws won't because the Constitution received over 80% of its source material directly or indirectly from the Word of God. So, most of our laws are not going to require us to violate the laws of God. But, you know, as time has passed, certain little things have gotten in the way, and it could happen. In that event, we obey the law of the, of the Lord, trust the Lord with the government. But in the meantime, we're to rejoice evermore, Give thanks in everything, no matter what's going down in the world around us. And you can do that if you trust God and take Him at His word. Trust Him unconditionally. Don't trust Him to the point that He meets your timetable. Lord, I trust you to do this. Now, if it doesn't happen before such and such, I'm going to have to declare bankruptcy or I'm going to die or something's going to happen here. you got a time limit. No, trust Him unconditionally. Doesn't matter about timing issues. Doesn't matter if you have to wait a year, two, or ten. If you know the end of the story and the outcome, you can get excited right now. That's God's part. Just trust Him that He's going to enable you to give you richly all things to enjoy. That's what He's going to do. He's going to order your steps. Trust Him to perfect that which concerns you. Trust Him that you'll be more than a conqueror through Jesus who loves you. Trust Him that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's what the Word says. It's either true or it's a lie. And when we come to a place of unconditional trust, our life changes because we get happy. We can rejoice evermore. We can give thanks for everything. And, you know, I'm not saying give thanks for a, uh, you know, a terrible disaster or crisis, but give thanks because there is no disaster or crisis that can outshine God's blessing, God's life, and God's provision for you. And if that's the way we approach life, I'll tell you what, takes all the care off of you. You start enjoying things. 
Hey, man, you can have a good time. You can laugh at my jokes. Be glad and thankful for my jokes. But give thanks for God for everything, you know, even a bad joke. So basically, this is, this is, this is the key to me. Trusting unconditionally in the Lord. So how do we come to this place? Because it is, it is the bottom line of what we want. Trust and faith are different. They're often used in the, same, in the same sentence like they're the same thing. They're not. Trust cannot exist without faith. You can't trust God if you don't even believe in Him or if you don't believe His Word is true. So it starts with faith. But you can have faith in the Word that God is the healer. He's the provider. He's Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shammah, Jehovah Rapha. He's all of these. Th you can believe all of that. Uh, but is he going to heal me when I get a terminal report? Uh, is he, you know, going to take care? I mean, we come to a place where conditions and circumstance make it seem like, well, this is, I'm not really as sure about this. Of course you can. You have to be sure. And, you know, I probably ought to, I ought to take a moment and go through a little dialogue here that if you've been part of this church a while, you've heard many times, uh, but it's still an important rationale for you to have in order to, to come to the place in the Lord you ought to be. I mean, everybody goes through a moment in time at some point in their life when they, they consider, you know, do I want to believe the Bible is the divine and final authority for my life. Do I, I mean, why has Christianity got all of the answers? Or I should say, uh, you know, doing the word, going to bring us into the full, fullness of God, shaping our life on the principle of the word of God. How do we know that? What, what makes us think that this is a better idea than the New Agers have? that this is a better idea than the, the Hindus or the Mohammeds or uh, Islamists or Buddhists or anybody else. I mean, there's so many options out there, so many philosophies. Why, do I, why should I think this is the one? Well, you know, everybody kind of goes through that at some point. And, um, you know, certainly approaches to the question differ a little bit depending on personality and background, life experiences, that kind of thing. But for me, I've always, if, if anything, over-rationalized, uh, tried to use reasoning to a degree that it was inappropriate even. Um, so my approach was to say, okay, let's look at this. Any other world religion or philosophical view of life can be traced to the mind of a man. Somebody had the idea about existentialism, about new age, about, you know, somebody had an idea or a thought. Every paradigm of life can be traced to the mind of a single man, a man that was as flawed and subject to error as you know your own self to be. You're going to hang your hat on that? Whereas Christianity uh, didn't have a single human author. It is described uh, as being divinely inspired, and it came through the mouths of almost a thousand different scribes and prophets over thousands of years. And yet it provides a perfectly clear picture of who God is, who you are, and your relationship to Him. So for that reason, I'm going to go toward Christianity. And if I've still got questions, then uh, uh, one of the things that you can pursue is the authentication of its divine origins through the fulfillment of scriptural prophecy over centuries, literally hundreds of and hundreds of fulfilled prophecies in the Word, 
which are intended to be a source of authentication for us as to its divine origins. There is no other pursuit uh, in, ter in terms of our view of the unseen realm in particular, life in general, but the unseen realm in particular, there's no other source of information that can compete with the Bible. And so basically, uh, this is the first consideration that you have to come to. The Bible is going to be what I invest my believing in. I mentioned the unseen realm. That's what it primarily is a revelation of. It will, of course, apply to a lot of the natural principles that uh, are going to be a part of our experience of life. Uh, but it is a primarily a revelation of the unseen realm, not the temporal realm. Science reveals and expands our knowledge of the physical world that we lived in, live in called the temporal realm because that word temporal means temporary is subject to change. What's the change agent? What brings change to this natural world? arena of truth that we have, it begins in the unseen realm, the realm that encompasses heaven and hell, God and the devil, life and death, angels and demons, the list goes on. Things that cannot be empirically validated are what is revealed in the Word of God. Nowhere else do you find this information from a reliable source that has the credentials the Bible has. So that's the foundation of what I'm saying. When you trust implicitly in what the Word tells you about your life, your experience of it, I mean, you have just unloaded all the cares of not knowing, all the confusion of who said what, all of the uh, uncertainties of what tomorrow holds because nobody knows why we're in the day we are. It just gets rid of all of that. And it provides a foundation for you to experience a level of peace, tranquility of heart and mind that is totally unavailable to you any other way. Whew. Man. So trust becomes an all-important issue. It is different than faith. It has to begin with your belief of the Word of God, but it's different than faith. You can believe Jesus is the healer. Jesus is your, uh, your source of provision in every arena of life. You can believe those things, but not embrace Him as your healer. Meaning, it's hard sometimes to subjectively internalize the promises for me. Yeah, I can view him as the healer, whew, but for me, man, I've got these symptoms. I'm hurting. I don't know. I, the doctor said this, and, you know, they said that, and, uh, you know, and so the doubts come. But we have to get beyond them. We have to come to a point of trust. Trust is the final outworking of faith. Actually, the word trust in the Greek New Testament means confident expectation. Same as is translated hope in some other spots in the New Testament. The word trust, at least one of the words, there are three different words that show up in the New Testament used for trust, but one of them is, and the primary one is, it means confident expectation. And I've said before, that's the final outworking of your faith. When you confidently expect something to occur, you're not hoping anymore in the sense of hanging on by your fingernails. I mean, you know this is going to work out this way. You know it. And it isn't just an empty proclamation. You know it in here. That's when it's going to manifest. Well, that's what trust is defined as, confident expectation. Well, okay. This has all been introductory. This might be a long sermon. But basically, uh, we see then, we want to talk about how, uh, how, to, how to generate this kind of trust. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's a, a daily affair. 
This is something you've got to do every day. These things that we're going to talk about. And, uh, you know, it, it becomes part of the pattern, say pattern, of your life. God deals in patterns. And this becomes part of the pattern of your life, the things you do to create this kind of unconditional trust and keep it there. But we saw, you know, when we preached, I preached on this a couple of Sundays back, um, we saw in Nahum uh, chapter 1, verse 7, they might have it there, yep. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. I talked about strongholds that Sunday and that our life's experience can be defined in terms of the strongholds that exist in our lives. They can be good, they can be bad. Many of us have heard the term used mostly in relationship to Satan, darkness, enemy strongholds, demonic strongholds. But that's just one kind of stronghold. The other kind is strongholds of God. And we see here in Nahum 1.7, it says, the Lord is good, a stronghold. And that's, that's like a, a place that the enemy can't breach. He can't get in. Your life is secure within, uh, you know, and you can enjoy things. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. But then he says, and he knoweth them that trust him. He links Trust with your indication of what your strongholds are. He makes a stronghold synonymous with trust. And, you know, the wrong kind of stronghold, the enemy stronghold, also talks about uh, that being what a person trusts in. Anything other than God is available for use by the enemy as a stronghold to bring death and cursing into your life. I mean, if your trust really is in your bank balance and ultimately uh, your skill, your intelligence, your capacity to make money, if your trust is in, you know, uh, a man other than yourself, a person other than yourself, or, uh, you know, a anything other than the Word, then it's going to be available to the enemy to produce his purposes in your life. And it's a stronghold that needs to be torn down. So we see two kinds of strongholds. They're both based on trust. Uh, one is enemy strongholds, and the other is God's stronghold. And so what, what, what more do we need to learn about this matter as New Covenant believers. We went to 2 Corinthians 10.4 uh, the last time I preached this. And we see, first of all, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So this is what our warfare is all about. There is a war between light and darkness, between good and evil, between God and the devil. I mean, it's, uh, he's already a defeated foe. God cast him back into the earth, but the war is for your soul. And it rages all, all of the time. Uh, you know, humanity and the influence that's going to direct a person's life is what the warfare is about. And God is, is saying here that our weapons aren't carnal or natural but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then he tells us about strongholds in the next verse. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. These are the ones that need to be pulled down. Every kind of imagination and high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And these are the ones we need to build up and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we see that the battleground is the mind. That's where your warfare is waged. It's spiritual warfare, granted, it originates in the unseen realm, but it takes place in the mind of man. This is the battleground. And you're going to have one of two kinds of imaginations. One that has been based on what secular, worldly, human wisdom says, 
or you're going to have an imagination that is based on what the Word of God says. That's God's stronghold, or if your trust is in what the world says, in what medical science can do, and I'm not demeaning medical science and the wonderful place they've played in advancing the uh, welfare of humanity in general. But if that's where your trust is, then it's a stronghold the enemy will use against you. And so essentially, imaginations becomes a key word here. I've preached about imagination a lot over the years. It's a powerful force available to all of us that will motivate your life, give it supernatural momentum in the direction that it's focused. You know, that's what God said about the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Nothing will be restrained from them that they have imagined to do. What you paint on the canvas of your mind is what gives your life direction and impetus. Don't ever make a mistake about that. And this is what imaginations also do, is they give you a stronghold of God or a stronghold of the devil. Provide momentum and direction to you along the path of God's will or along the path of your own will uh, or the will of whoever has influenced you outside the Word of God. So basically, imagination should be viewed as a pattern of thought. Now it says bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When you get wrong thoughts, stop it on the level of a thought. When you get a thought that says, you know, I got a pain in my side, that could be, uh, you know, that could be cancer. Stop it. Grab it, cast it down on the level of a thought. Because until it becomes a pattern of thinking, it won't redirect your life. It will become a pattern if you don't get rid of it. There'll be another one that adds itself to it, another one that adds itself to it, and pretty soon it'll have you acting on and behaving a certain way. I used an example last service that may, not, may or may not be a very good example. It was, you know, I make a joke about my, my enjoyment of pecan pie. Amen. And uh, sometimes it becomes obsessive and it's out of whack for me, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a place where my flesh sometimes exerts its dominance. And so, basically, uh, it usually starts with a thought. I'm landing in bed in the evening, and, huh, there's a pecan pie in the refrigerator. If it just stopped with that thought, I'd be okay, but it starts a pattern. And then the next thought might be, well, you know, uh, there's... 400 calories in a slice of pecan pie. Uh, I had a good workout this morning. I figure I burned seven or 800 calories. So I could actually have two pieces of pecan pie and it wouldn't affect my weight at all. You know, I'd still be okay. And the next thing I know, I'm up there eating the whole pie. But it's, this is the pattern. It's a pattern of thought. And that's what imaginations are. They're not individual thoughts. You are told, however, to take individual thoughts and get rid of them before they become a pattern that will produce behavior. And so an imagination is really how you envision your future probabilities. Again, I've said these things before, and I've said them often, but imagination doesn't have anything to do with the past or the present. That's already happened. You know what that is. Imagination always has to do with how you view your future probabilities. Now, the future probabilities that are based on what God says about you are the ones you need to, to occupy the way you view your future, your imagination. You need to build it around the Bible and what word of God, the Word of God says to you, that you can do all things through Christ. You know, this desire you've got reigning in your heart to do this or to do that, you can do that. You can do it in Christ. You can. You need to 
shape an image of your future walking down this path and putting all of the little pieces together that define what you would like to see your future look like. Instead, many people shape their, use their imagination to shape, you know, it's shaped by fear. Well, if this doesn't happen, then that'll happen, and that'll happen. It may go bankrupt. I might die, you know, you know, whatever. And that becomes your imagination. One translation says, cast down vain, meaning empty or foolish imaginations. But you create from the thoughts that you bring captive to the obedience of Christ, you create a vision of your future based on what the Word of God says. And this is what creates trust. The more you see that, the more you visit that, the more time you spend there letting the Word of God shape your expectation, your confident expectation of what is yours in Christ by virtue of your covenant with God, the more trust is built until you get to a place where it's unconditional and the peace of God reigns in your mind and in your heart. You can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You can. You can count all things as thankful, being thankful for them, even the things that look bad. God will show you because he says, he says all things work for good. For who? Them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Well, loving the Lord simply means you've given your life to him. The word love is charity. It means to give. And so to love the Lord means you've given yourself to him. You're not your own anymore. You've been bought with a price, and you've, you, you've, you've made that your core truth. You're not your own anymore. So you're loving the Lord, and called according to His purpose means that your desire is to live out the purpose of God for your life. Not just any arbitrary purpose. Not just what you think might be a good thing to do, but what He wants you to do. Now here comes the final catch. You know, I, I trust the Lord, but I'm not sure I trust myself to hear His voice clearly and then to carry through with what I hear. I'm not sure I trust myself. Yeah, I know the Word says that He's perfecting that which concerns me. He, the Word says He's finishing within me the good work He's begun. He's working within me to do His will and His good pleasure. But can I trust myself? And the answer often is no. We're not very sure that we're following our own desires or God's desire for us. And I would suggest that there's an answer to that. If we turn to Psalm 37, 4, uh, you know, we can bring it up here quickly. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, that's talking about him placing the desire in your heart, not fulfilling it. Not at this point. He says, if you delight yourself in him, that means you're fellowshipping with him. Wrong desires means you're fellowshipping with the enemy of your soul. Don't even know it. It's where you're focusing your attention and truly your affection. So delight means take pleasure in. You know, so if you're spending time with God, taking pleasure in His presence in your life, then He's going to give you the desires of your heart. And the next verse talks about the fulfillment Commit thy way unto the Lord. That means you're going to do it his way the best you can. Trust in him and he'll bring it to pass. Once again, trust. So one of the primary understandings, particularly young people coming out of high school and college, need to have, you know, wondering where to go, uh, where to work, what vocational pursuit, 
Higher education or not? If so, what to study? The list goes on. You need to learn to trust the desires that reside in your heart. Understanding that there are wrong desires in, that, that can fill your heart, that originate from your carnal nature and are prompted by the enemy of your soul, you know. There can be wrong desire in there, lustful desires, uh, covetous desires. I don't know, you know, you can figure out the list. It's a long one. But how do you know that this is really not your flesh's desire? I wrestle with that where my flying was concerned for a long time. As I wondered if flying was keeping me out of the pulpit, keeping me out of the call of God. And the answer was no, but I, I don't have time to go there. I'm just saying it's something we all wrestle with. Is I, am I doing this because God wants me to do this? Or is, uh, uh, you know, is this something that my flesh has come up with? And I think there's a way to know the answer to that. Um, and it has everything to do with the matter of trust because you want to invest your trust in what God has put in you should be your endeavor uh, down the road or in the future. So um, let's take a look at... Um, where do I want to go now? Let's take a look at, uh, back at um, where we started. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 16, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, everything give thanks. Now the two hard things, really hard, I mean, praying without ceasing isn't hard if you understand what it means. But rejoicing evermore and in everything give thanks, that's really tough. Notice, notice that it's those things sandwich praying. Praying without ceasing. Meaning that they will exist if the prayer without ceasing is there. They won't exist if prayer without ceasing isn't there. Because it's those three together that he says is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So praying without ceasing, what does that mean? How do we do that? Prayer simply means communion with God. Too often we define prayer as being, you know, supplication, petitions. You know, I've got a laundry list of things I need to ask God about or I need to complain to God about or whine to God about or whatever. Uh, you know, that too often is what we think of as prayer. But if you look up the Greek word used for pray here, uh, supplication is one of the things that uh, is in the definition, but it says worship. Worship. I think the core understanding about praying without ceasing is to worship the Lord. And that doesn't mean you isolate yourself, hold your hands up to the Lord and sing songs to Him. Because not everybody can sing as well as I can. So it doesn't mean that. It's an attitude of heart. It is a recognition of of the fact that he says he never leaves you, he never forsakes you. He's closer than your next breath. He is the breath of life. I love Jamie's analogies to, to, to breathing because I'd never seen it this way until he taught it. But of course, that's what Yahweh means, the breath of life. And that's what God did when he created Adam, breathe the breath of life into him, and he became a living soul. So every time you breathe, it can be a reminder to you that God is in you closer than your next breath. He is the breath of life. And this is the key to praying without ceasing. Having an, a consciousness of God's presence in your life throughout your day. There was a Catholic priest wrote a book called Practicing the Presence. Oh, it's a good book. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? Yeah. Was that Brother Lawrence? Okay. At any rate, uh, man, it's such a truth. Because if you can learn to walk through your day conscious of the presence of God, it will transform your life. 
completely. It's not an easy thing to do, especially right out of the box. I mean, because we all deal with numerous distractions and phone calls and uh, people interrupting and meetings and appointments. And I mean, you know, life can be challenging just to get through a day, much less being conscious of the presence of the Lord during that day. But it's a learned practice. It's a learned thing. It's a, you carry an awareness with you, you know, throughout your day. If you're driving in your car, uh, you're probably having a little conversation internally with the Lord. Uh, you're probably conversing with Him, fellowshipping with Him, thinking about Him, reminding yourself that the greater one lives inside of you, lives within you, the creator of the universe, the source of all power, all knowledge, lives within you. And He's with you every moment of every day. That's the abiding presence. Now, if you walk through your day thinking this way, you're not going to be intimidated by anything. That's the truth. And when you're interacting with somebody on the phone or in person, you know, and, and this is your mindset, okay, let me see what God's going to say to me through them. Or perhaps what I'm to, I'm to say to them. Now, don't get weird with this, but just it's an awareness. You know, I might be saying something. I need to listen to my heart that's going to be really important to them and the Lord in terms of his will for them and vice versa. So, I mean, this makes you a listener. A lot of people have trouble being listeners. They're too busy trying to get their own opinion on the table. But if you realize this exchange can enhance the purpose of the Lord who dwells in both of you, if you're interacting with another believer, then it changes the way you listen. Changes, it changes your conduct in every regard. If you're aware of the presence of the Lord, you're not going to go into that bar, do a little carousing on the side. You're certainly not going to get into a bed of adultery and take him with you. It's transformative when you begin to walk through your day aware of the presence of God in your life. That is how you pray without ceasing. Now, remember Psalm 37, 4? It says, He gives you the desires of your heart when you're delighting yourself in Him. This is delighting yourself in Him. Enjoying His presence, being mindful of it. Not putting Him on the back burner until next Sunday, but you're with Him. You are aware of Him. You are interacting with Him. Oh, that's how you pray without ceasing. And of course, then there's, look at uh, Mark eleven twenty four for a minute. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Most people read that as being, okay, I got certain desires here. I'm going to believe that I receive them when I pray and I'll get them. And they don't. The reason is, I think it needs to be read this way that your desires from God are going to come when you pray. What things soever you desire when you pray, that's when they're going to show up. It's when you're in this place with God, delighting yourself in Him, and the impartation of those desires are going to be from God. Now, these desires, you know, you always measure them against the Word. He's never going to contradict himself. And if there's nothing in the Word that would prohibit the desire that's born in there, consider it to be of God. Trust that you've heard from the Lord. This is the final outworking of trust. You will begin to discern the path of God for your life, the will of God for your life, You'll be getting more and more excited about your life as you trust these desires that come to you when you're praying to be a revelation of God to you. You begin to build an imagined future, a future expectation of your probabilities, 
in different areas, whatever they may be. You begin to build it on the basis of these desires that came to you while you were praying. This is a way to live, church. It keeps you going no matter how rough things may seem, no matter what the challenges may be. You're back in the Word because you're with God. You know, lean not to my own understanding. I don't know how this is going to work out. I just gonna know it's going to be for good because His ways are higher than mine. I may not always understand them. He makes a way where there is no way, where there is no way in the natural. He makes a way anyhow. All things are possible to him who believe, and I believe, I believe who I am in Christ. And so, you know, this makes you happy. And when you're praying this way without ceasing, you can rejoice evermore. You can read, you know, sometimes I read more joke books than I do the Bible, trying to find one good joke. Hard to find a good joke. But I enjoy that because I think, you know, I don't know. I don't know why I enjoy it, but I enjoy it. <laughs> so it's like you can rejoice forevermore. When you're living this way, it's like your life is supernaturally put together. It makes no difference what happens out there. You're going to do your best to do the right thing, to live for God, love people, believe the best and hope the best. You're going to do... You're the best you can do, but man, God's got it. He is never leaving you or forsaking you. He's closer than the next breath. He's right there. Oh, I just heard what God told me through that person, or oh, I just, I just learned that what I said to them was life-changing. Wow. You know, everything becomes different when you practice the presence of God. Try it. See if you can make it through a day and keeping him on the forefront of your thinking. You know, you catch your mind drifting. No, just bring it back there. He's here. That's all you have to do. Think about him, his greatness. He's right there. He's in you. You know, and keep him involved in your negotiations, in your business transactions and dealings, in your sales calls. Keep him there in your conversations, in your meetings. You'll be able to rejoice evermore. You'll be able to give thanks in everything. The peace of God will garrison about your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And man, your life will be better than it's ever been before. Yeah. Let's stand, please.